I guess I should have bought those, brought those pink tennis shoes like my friend Texas Wendy Davis wore. Could have skipped up here faster. Sorry for the lengthy bio. My favorite part was being Gretchen's friend. It means a lot to me. Uh, we've been through a, a lot together over the years. And um, part of the reason I'm down here is so many of your great Lowndes County Democrats are so active and engaged at the state level. And uh, I was honored to receive, a, I think, a good deal of support from down here when I ran to represent the state at the Democratic National Committee. To be honest with you, I didn't know what to expect. Right? We hear DNC, and most people think DNC and think of just the conventions every four years, the Democratic National Convention. But we actually are governed by DNC. <laughs> uh, we're governed by um, a, a committee at the national level that has representatives from every state that governs our party at that national level. And then, of course, we have the state party level and the local party level. So I am honored to be one of five people who were elected to represent Georgia at the DNC. Really exciting part in some people's mind is I'm now a super delegate for the 16 convention. Um, so, uh, so, so as that primary process develops, I hope you'll tell me uh, who you think will be our best nominee because we sure need to keep up this uh, track record at the national level and we need to work to bring that energy down to our local level. And it looks like you were doing some great work here locally, which I'm very proud of you for doing. So let me say, I was like, oh great, I'm gonna to get to go up and tell all those people in Washington, right? Because that's where we always think those national people are in Washington, that they need to not ignore states like Georgia. And they need to pay attention to rural areas. And they need to think about all these issues we sit around and talk about every day. Well, I hate to disappoint you. <laughs> so far, I haven't publicly, in a big way, in a voting way, been able to deliver those messages but I'm starting building those relationships so I can start delivering those messages because that's what I've heard, that's what I feel, that's what I've seen, and that's what I know needs to be delivered up in Washington. The very first uh, Democratic National Committee meeting I got to go to was after the convention in Charlotte. Um, to be honest with you, I'm, honest is the only way I know how to be, folks. I was a little, it was a little anticlimactic to me. I was expecting, again, some big intense something where we had a policy decision to make or some sort of battle. Well, basically, we had a meeting where we said, wasn't that a great week? Didn't we have fun here in Charlotte? <laughs> and it was a great week and we did have fun. But, I've, but all the people who put that week-long show on TV together, I think didn't have the energy to have another meeting after that. So the real energy was that week and we accomplished a lot in Charlotte. The second DNC meeting I've attended on our behalf that we've had was the day after the inauguration. You'll never guess what the big excitement that day was. Wasn't that a great speech yesterday? <laughs> uh, and then I found out that the officer elections at the Democratic National Committee, to be frank with you, is kind of like our officer elections at the Democratic Party of Georgia used to be. The big guy decides who the officers can be. And we go, okay. So I was, you know, again, to be frank with you, a little disappointed there. However, our big guy happens to be the President of the United States, and he has, I think, made some pretty wise decisions. So I think we should be pleased. So let me tell you quickly, again, most people don't know, and folks not in this room probably wouldn't care so much, but I think you might care to learn a little bit about who our national level officers are. I'm sure you all know that dynamic, amazing congresswoman from Florida, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, has continued on, uh, continues to serve as the chair of our party. I personally think she does a, a, a great job uh, bringing voice to so many important issues. And, you know, there's some people who think we ought to be nicer, and some people think we ought to be more attacking. I think she kind of does a good job of, of finding a good balance there. Um, Many of you are familiar with Donna Brazil, right? She's a national talking head, accomplished uh, political operative. She also leads the party's Voting Rights Institute, and she continued on as one of the party's vice chairs. Uh, one of the vice chairs of the national party is typically someone with a strong connection to labor, and our newest vice chair there is a woman named Maria Elena Durazo who is from Los Angeles, and she was very active in the Federation of Labor uh, in California, uh, obviously, and 
and nationally with the AFL-CIO. One of the most exciting people to me to get to meet is another of our vice chairs. We like vice chairs, apparently. We like vice chairs a lot. Uh, another uh, congresswoman, this time a freshman congresswoman from Hawaii, some of you may have seen her on TV, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard or Gabbard, I, I'm still not quite clear how to pronounce her last name, but the exciting thing is not just that she's smart and articulate and, and young and kind of strikingly beautiful, she's also the first uh, person of American Samoan descent to serve in Congress and the first Hindu. Uh, and she joined Tammy Duckworth as the first two female combat veterans to serve in Congress. And I tell you what, they are having their experience show and their leadership show in terms of so many of these issues. So uh, really proud, really proud of her. And proud of her too, again, stepping up. I mean, she's young, but to step up and say, in addition to these responsibilities, I'm willing to be a leader of the party. I think it says a lot about her. Uh, are we have a new secretary of the party. Many of you remember Alice German, who was has been the secretary, I think, as long as I've been alive. <laughs> and she has stepped down as secretary. And our new secretary is a, a terrific young woman from Baltimore. She's the mayor of Baltimore. Her name is Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Um, I'm, although I'm going to give you a pitch for some money, I'm not one of these big money crowd people. But you know, at the la national level, particularly for the president. There's a lot of big fundraising that's needed and required. And this past couple of presidential cycles, there's a new organization that started called the Futuro Fund. And the gentleman who was a founder and a leader in that organization, Henry Munoz III, is now the party's national finance chair. So we're very excited, not only because he's a big money guy and we need to be raising that big money, but also because he has done a lot of great outreach in the Latino and Hispanic communities to bring those folks into that fundraising mix too, a lot of business people. Um, the municipal elected officials are represented um, by Mayor R.T. Ryback from Minneapolis. Uh, we have at the national level an association of all the state party chairs, and that is led by a gentleman from New Hampshire's party named Raymond Buckley. And some of you may remember, I can't remember if it was last year, the year before last, he spoke at the Atlanta, our state party dinner, did a great job there. And Andrew Tobias continues on as our treasurer for the National Party. He's done that since 1999. I, I couldn't wish that on someone necessarily, all those changes with the finance rules, but he's done a good job keeping us straight. So that's an update on where the national leadership is. I'm excited in August, apparently we're having a big full-blown, finally DNC meeting that's gonna be two days and different council meetings. I'm joining the rural council. I live in Rome, Georgia, and we're not rural as y'all are, but we're not big city. And I really um, have a great deal of respect. I work for Congressman Bishop down here. I've got a lot of schooling and what's important about rural Georgia, so I'm hoping to represent us on the rural caucus and the small business caucus. Um, before I get into talking about a little state party business, I want to just talk about one issue that's so strong in the news this past week. We had some good news from the Supreme Court, some mixed news from the Supreme Court, and frankly, in my opinion, some really dreadful news, but I guess it could have been worse, about the Voting Rights Act. Um, for those of you who might not have been on top of things, the Supreme Court, a lot of people thought they were going to strike down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which is the part that requires certain communities to have any changes they make to election law pre-cleared is the word they use for it. Send it to the Justice Department and say, is this okay? We're not doing anything wrong here, are we? Uh, and to be frank with you, if you watch this a while, people do a lot of things wrong, and the Justice Department routinely says, uh-uh, try again, start over, and stop some bad things. Frankly, I don't think they stop enough bad things, but that Section 5 is the part sort of keeps people honest, right? It's the, the looking over their shoulder, making sure they're doing things right, to not backslide back to the way we used to be. Well, the interesting thing is Section 4, Part 4, Section 5, is the part that says who falls under Section 5. And the Supreme Court just said, y'all came up with this Section 4 part like 30 years ago. You haven't updated it. All these poor little states in the South and a few other parts of other states are put upon. It's not fair. 
So they struck down Section 4 and said to Congress, we told you you needed to fix it. They just looked at it and they didn't fix it, but they told them they needed to fix it. Congress, I don't think, has nerve to fix it, but they said, so Section 5 basically doesn't exist now because the part where they said who it applies to, they got rid of. So why am I bringing that up? Not just to be a bearer of bad news. I'm bringing that up because that issue alone, there are umpteen other issues we ought to be engaged upon, but we have an opportunity. There are Republicans, believe it or not, who are saying Congress needs to act quickly and do what the Supreme Court has told us to do. I think we ought to take those congressmen at their word that they want to do that and get our good Democratic congressmen to go along with them and help them do it and try to make it right. My personal opinion is let's make all 50 states fall under Section 5 if you ask me. <laughs> because you saw it just that day, literally two hours later. Texas, who's been wrestling with the Justice Department to get horrible, awful, dreadful, taking us back maps, approved, they said, woohoo! We're out from underneath that Section 5. Our bad maps go forward right now. They did it with impunity. Right. All right? We need to take their overreach and let people see they are doing bad things. And then turn to Congress and our members of Congress. And I'm sure your member of Congress from down here is going to stand up loud on this issue. People have talked about how it ought to, the new Voting Rights Act ought to be named after Congressman John Lewis, right? Another Georgian we're all so proud of. I think we need to, to keep pushing on this issue, to keep agitating on this issue, but not just saying, this is horrible and rotten, but start figuring out how we can say, and this is the way to fix it, and this is how Congress can act, right? That's what we need to do. We need to protest what they've done in Texas. I'm not just excited about because a woman I share a name with, Wendy Davis, uh, made national news and had this great filibuster. I'm excited that there are thousands of people who care about anything the legislature is doing, right? Enough to stand up and talk. And that's what we need to do. Too many times we all sit around and try to figure out what we think those people in charge of the party should be doing or those people in charge of our state should be doing. Well, I'm here to tell you that. There aren't just four of you, or five of you, or include me as a, a close friend, who represent your interests on the state party. We are the Democratic Party of Lowndes County, and of the state, and of the nation, all right? We don't all hold elective posts. I hold too many, I'm sorry, to make you read that whole list. But I care about these things. But you all care about different pieces of what the party should be doing. And you all have good ideas and good energy for what the party ought to be doing. So if the party's not doing it, if that guy over there or that woman over there isn't doing what needs to be done, help them do it. Tell them it's important. If it's something you don't have the time or the resources to do, find somebody else who does. So it's up to us. So I get back to where my friend Laverne was. Party's in a mess, y'all. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. But we're in a transition phase. And what does that mean? We can move forward. The good news is we're about as far in the ditch as we can. <laughs> so in some ways, there's no way but up. But you know what? We're gonna just keep crawling around in the ditch if folks like us don't get involved and start pushing and lifting and fussing and helping. So I have a great way for anybody in this room to be able to help the state party. You know the state party has lots of big fundraising initiatives and frankly when we get a new chair at the end of August, they, the first thing on their plan in my book better be a, a fundraising plan with those fat cats. But so often in the past few years, our big fat cat fundraising has been to pay the rent and, and pay the interns. We have to have a way for the routine opportunities, routine needs of the party to be met and the big fundraising be done to do big things like, I don't know, get us a U.S. Senator next year, please. please. Open seats come from a long offer. We've got to take advantage of this one. And if the party isn't well positioned to respond to all the ugliness, think in some ways we could have a field day next year. 
What crazy thing is the Republicans going to say next? We got a whole herd of those candidates. They're going to say crazy things every week. It would be great to have people in the party who can call out that nastiness, call out that ignorance, and let our candidate, right? And let our candidate, fingers, I'm, my fingers are crossed for Michelle Nunn, let our candidate go out and be the positive and be the forward and be the bringing people together, right? But to do that, our party has to get back healthy. And a couple years ago, the party created something called the Yellow Dog Club. Any of you familiar with what a Yellow Dog Democrat is? Yeah. Dennis, I bet, can you tell us what a Yellow Dog Democrat is? Bill Bush, for anybody on the ticket who's Democrat, he's a Yellow Dog. That's right. right. Some old Yellow Dog we drug up is better than any Republican, right? That's the way some of us folks still know. So we created this club to allow sustaining support for the party. And what that means is just a recurring contribution. With the wonders of modern technology, you know you can do a credit card and we'll process it every month. It starts at just $10 a month, this Yellow Dog Club. It's got three different levels. $10 to $24 a month is the first level, and there's some benefits about it. $25 to $49 is the next level, and then $50 to $80 is the next level. Now, what I would love to do, I brought this big manila envelope of forms to pass out in the room. But you know what? When Wendy left Rome, Georgia this morning, much too early after staying up much too late, she didn't look in the envelope and see if the forms were in there. <laughs> so I'm embarrassed to say I don't have the forms with me, but I know we can get forms back down here, and I know anyone goes to the Democratic Party website, Yellow Dog Club is right there on that front page, and, uh, and hopefully you can talk about it at your upcoming meetings. But what we'd love to do across the state, we're reaching out to state committee members and county parties across the state and to activists like you and saying, I, I can't write a thousand dollar check. I'm just not in a place to do that. If I can give ten dollars a month, I might sometimes, I, I can give twenty dollars a month. <laughs> so whatever is comfortable for you, I'd like to encourage you to look at that and consider being a sustaining donor at a, at a level that you're comfortable with to the Democratic Party. And what I'd really love for the Lowndes County Democrats is for y'all to come up with a, a, an idea of between our members or between the folks who come to our meetings or between the folks who are there at the dinner, we think we can raise $200 a month, right? You know, 20 people at $10 each, 10 people at $20 each, what, however you want to mix it up. But I'd love for y'all to think about what you think you could do and maybe challenge your neighbors, right? Hey, Thomas County, bet we could do better than you, right? Kind of that good rivalry, you know, that good rivalry. But most important, I want to thank you for being here tonight. A lot of places you could do the week of, be the week of 4th of July. I'm honored to be down here. Another 4th of July week with y'all. Um, General David Poitier sends his fond regards. Enjoyed being with you previously when he was running for governor. And I was honored to work on his campaign. But thank you for what you do. Please stay committed to the ideals that we share. Please remember, each of you is the party. The party's not some disembodied something someplace else. It's the people, and we need to act that way and act on it. So thanks so much for having me tonight.